Zakalakher, Sheikh Ahmed, Sister Muna Ali. Um, we do have a few more minutes for questions and answers, and we have a microphone for the floor. So, does anyone have any questions to engage the panel on this excellent topic? I saw uh, Wesson and then uh, Sister Marcy. Very much, uh, Sister Mona and Imam Ahmed. And I specifically would like to address the activism, which was not too much covered in this, but perhaps in the morning session. But I had personal um, experience with um, young, when I say young, I'm talking about early teens, um, Muslims who grew up here in Phoenix who just grow up in the religion, but they don't really know what the religion is about. They wear the hijab and so on. You know, it's just up. As far as they're concerned, they just, they're just in it. And for um, Sister Muna, I just wanted to say, I, I agree with you a lot, because this issue, one 14-year-old said to me, you know, um, she thinks that uh, voting is haram when I was, uh, very much involved, at, you know, this past election season, and um, and uh, uh, Imam Ahmed, you know, another 14-year-old um, said to me that uh, they don't understand God. You know, it's like I said, well, why did you say that? Well, because he doesn't have a family. I mean, you know, look around. We are all his children. You know. I didn't understand it. I am a revert myself, and even some Muslims, when, when you say before, we're his children, they say, no, we are Allah's slave. So I even have that um, the conflict there. But uh, this is why I'm saying within the Muslim community itself, it is difficult. We are trying to define ourselves as American Muslims, but within the Muslim community itself, it is very, very difficult. Was that the question, Sister Marcy? Well, what I wanted to um, address, I, I'm very glad that both speakers, but you know, this issue politically okay. um, and religiously, the, as a separation of church and state, and so on, is the issue, is, is, is the difficulty. So the political involvement and um, marrying that between our identities as Muslim yes. and American. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We'll turn it over to the panel. Thank you for your question. Um, well, even though we might not have called it activism, everything that I talked about is activism. The, whether it's uh, generating literature, whether it's uh, ser you know service uh, um, service work. Uh, whether it's uh, carrying, carrying, on, carrying on the civil rights movement is the quintessential activism. Now, identity, as, as I mentioned earlier, is, 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 a, is complex. I think a lot of us seem to have an intuitive sense of what it is, but identity is a, is a negotiated product, is even within the Muslim. What is, it, what is the definition of a Muslim? Right? Ten people can give you ten different things beyond la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. How is it to live as a Muslim? Everybody will have a different definition of that. Add to it, you're an, uh, an African American or an Arab or a uh, or a 20 year old versus a 50 year old. So I think uh, we need to keep those things in mind that we will ne never have a stereotype. In fact, if we do, we're in trouble. If we say this is the only way to be a Muslim American, then we are in trouble. Because there are as diverse as many ways of being a Muslim as, and being an American as there are Muslims and Americans. That's uh, my first point. My second point is we talk about young people and often, and this is one of the, uh, I dedicated an entire chapter to this in my, in my dissertation, this notion of an identity crisis. That young Muslims are undergoing identity crisis and that that's somehow alarming and it's a pathological uh, issue. But identity crisis is a normal develop, part of development. And I think we need to give them the space and the guidance. So it, it, the religious part, if they don't know, then that, uh, that's a failure on our part because we didn't make it relevant for them. 
I taught in Islamic schools, and I have seen those young children that I taught in Islamic school now as adults. I ran a class or a book club, and basic things, like what are the five pillars, they did not know. So there is something wrong with the way we teach Islam, and that is what we need to work on. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do, inshallah. I would add to this that um, one of the challenges for us is to to have the knowledge and the education uh, to separate the culture from a uh, religion. Most of our gatherings and even Islamic centers or community centers um, are dominant by this culture or that, which really uh, uh, compromise the Islamic ID and the activities that will enhance the Islamic ID. So for example, uh, such a uh, conference, such hot topics, look how many people will come. It has, uh, a culture, uh, if it's a cultural event, you will see 10 times of this, of, of, of this number. So we need really uh, uh, to move, to free ourselves from this culture or that, to have our focus on the, uh, the Islamic issues that uh, relate to America and the American issues that relate to Islam. To make this our top uh, uh, priority in order to clarify this path in front of the, uh, uh, the, the, the new generation. Even to modify the first generation uh, views for better education, to move from the past to the present, to look at the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Wasen, you'll be the last question. I was just going to follow up with Iman Suwarti. Please use the microphone if you don't mind. I was good. The question was towards Iman. I mean, I think you just answered it, but I, I guess my question was how do we teach the majority of the Muslim community who are not at, at these events, who don't go to stuff like this, and who maybe just come to the message once a week during Salat Jamaat or something like that? Um, how do you, as an Imam, who do you think is responsible for that education and, and how do they go about doing it? I mean, for example, should, should the sermons on Friday be changed to talk about these event, these things, these modern day issues, the sensitive issues that you talked about, or do you continue to talk about faith and um, you know practice, what practices Muslims should do? I guess I wanted to hear your thoughts. Well, my personal view of the uh, weekly khutbah is a weekly admonition, a, a, a weekly uh, message that relates to the uh, circumstances and to the uh, current uh, uh, situation. Uh, maybe we cannot discuss the details of this during the khutbah, but we can bring the attention, give a message, uh, then invite the community to the discussion. Uh, the weekly halakas, the, the lectures, the activities, the seminars will fit more to, um, uh, to discuss the details and establish uh, the foundation for, for, for these issues. Uh, I believe we imams ourselves uh, need to uh, need training on these issues. Because, you know, till 9-11 was uh, inviting uh, an imam from a foreign country was very, very common. Uh, if there's something good came out of 9-11, maybe this door was a block. So you have to make your imams locally here and you have to find that you know, and you need to be in the spot, and you need to be sensitive, you need to be aware to these modern issues, which really, I believe, uh, sharp a lot uh, uh, our views. Uh, but we as imams, we as uh, Islamic Center and community centers, uh, administrations, uh, we need trainings, we need um, uh, uh, discussion in order to pass this message to our communities. We first need to be aware of this and educated of this. I go to Imams' conferences a lot, um, like two, three hundred Imams, for example, in uh, uh, the annual conference. I assure you, less than 50 who uh, are up to date in their views and their awareness. With respect to them, their sincerity, their honesty, their humbleness, their education, their knowledge. But in Islam, in order to have good, right fatwa, knowledge is not enough. Knowledge is half of the way. 
that I don't have is the awareness of the locality and the circumstances. So how, you, how can you integrate the text with the event, with the locality? Awareness of the text, lacking the ability of the awareness of the locality, will create a damage. Being an expert in the locality but lacking the text will create another damage. The best ones and the most successful and guided ones and fruitful ones, I believe, will be those who have both sides. The authentic knowledge with the uh, good awareness of the locality and the society. Yeah. I'm talking about myself uh, for now 18 years in America. I believe every year I change and learn something new. I'm still learning. I, I, I assure you what I learn, what I do not know still is more than what, what I know. At least having this attitude will keep me searching and thinking and listening and taking notes and summarizing and uh, trying to educate myself in order to pass it. And I found it very, very successful and very, very fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just final remarks from uh, Sister Muna, and then we'll wrap up the, this little workshop. Thank you. Um, just the word in defense of the Imams. I think the Imams in America are burdened. We expect them to be religious experts, marriage counselors, psychologists, physicians, uh, interfaith uh, expert, and in some ways, it's a community cop out. And for no pay. And for no pay. Yeah, for no pay. But I think one of the things that we need to do is we have so many resources in our community. We have professors in all the different fields, and if their problem is that they speak about the community level, well, we just need to raise everybody. And maybe they need to forget their, uh, you know, their, their specific fields and language because they teach young people in college. There is no reason why they can't teach in community. So I think we need to divide. If physicians can, if physicians cannot learn every part of the body and be experts in it, we should not expect our imams to be doing everything. And this is where the community needs to pull its resources and capitalize on all these talents that are hidden in the community. I think, I, I call them the usual suspects. Everywhere you go, there are you know, a handful of people that are doing all the work in the community. And I think this is where the, the activist and the leadership needs to say, okay, it's time to pass the baton. Thank you. <laughs> Help me thank uh, Imam Ahmed and Mr. Manan for a wonderful workshop. And the conversation doesn't stop here, the dialogue doesn't stop here. We ask you to continue this dialogue amongst yourself and in your communities. Um, we have another session, another parallel session that is going to be starting uh, now. Um, one will be in this room, and then the topic will be why it's our duty to stand up, and that will be with Imam Anas and Sister Zahra. And the parallel session to that will be in room 207 um, with Sister Mia Suleiman and uh, Brother uh, Attorney Hassan Shibley as well on the importance of engaging elected officials and allies. So please pick your topic um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. The information that was actually presented during that session was, you know, very high level, and we need to continue this conversation within our communities as well. Uh, same thing for the, this next session. It's going to be a very exciting session. I think we're waiting on one more speaker to actually arrive here, but uh, just a little bit about this, uh, you know, from this next session, we really want to highlight why it's our duty to stand up. Um, you know, and I'll just give a high level overview of that, because from an Islamic perspective, as Muslims, we have a duty it's in our traditions that you know the Prophet وسلم, taught us that we need to stand up against injustice. No matter what the odds were against him during his time, uh, he always stood up for what was right. He always stood up for justice. And you know, there's a there's a tradition within our faith to stand up 
uh, in the realm of justice and pursuing social justice within a society. The same thing as Americans, we have that same uh, that same tradition here, you know, within the activist community. So we have two awesome speakers. Um, you know, one of them is the former chairman of Care Arizona. Uh, you know, a, a big cornerstone of the community uh, who will be speaking, Imam Anas Halal, and then uh, Zahar Bilu, who you've heard from a little bit earlier as well. But we do have a moderator for this session, uh, Sister Aisha, so she'll come up and give the formal introductions. All right, like he just said, this session is a very important session because personally for me, I feel like sometimes I don't know what I should do and how I should do it and why I should do it. I understand that Islam teaches us to be just and one of the names of Allah is just. And inshallah, we're gonna learn some great topics for this session. The session's called Why It's Your Duty to Stand Up. And like he said earlier, Anas Hilehi, he is going to speak about the topic. He was an imam, I mean, he, sorry, he is an imam, alhamdulillah, and a former care chairman. And right now, here is Zahara Bilayru, I hope I said it right, inshallah. And she is currently the executive director of CARE, San Francisco Bay Area. Now, I'm gonna leave you guys with a quote before I let these amazing speakers begin. It was once said by Martin Luther King, injustice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. Just take a moment to think about that. In a time when we see oppression and injustice everywhere around us, many of us feel, many of us feel like, Oh, it will pass. This is just something that's always happened. It's nothing new, but that's wrong. Feeling helpless and left out and effective. So say that this will pass in time, like I said earlier. Why standing by and doing nothing is also the appropriate, inappropriate thing to do. This session will discuss why is our time and tradition as Muslims and as well as Americans to stand up for our rights and stand up for other peoples as well. Islamically, they're going to talk about it, and from an American aspect, because we are Muslims in America. We aren't just Muslims, we are just Americans, we are both. And let them begin. Thank you guys so much. Um, this topic is very important in the sense that it is a very relevant topic uh, to us here in the United States of America. Uh, obviously from an Islamic point of view, uh, some people even refer to Islam as the religious of justice. Because of the so many verses in the Quran and the tradition, traditions you find from the Prophet, peace be upon him, talking and addressing this important topic of justice. Uh, obviously, I'm not gonna quote all of the verses, but I'd like to probably highlight one of them, which I think is very, very strong. Uh, and in this verse, which you find in Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, or, 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 uh, you know, and it says the father and the relatives. I'll, I'll remember it in a minute, inshallah. So here it says, O oh, you who believe, uh, uphold justice. So here we see a direct command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, asking all of believers, so an, an address to all believers, to uphold justice. And if you look at the Arabic structure, it, it is the exaggerated form. Qawwam is someone who's doing it on a regular basis. So you don't just do it once or twice. You don't just do it uh, <coughs> once uh, in a year or when you feel like it. It is actually a, a mode, it's a conduct. It's something you do on a regular basis. This is how you're known, this is how you're defined. And it says, Despite yourself, or even if you're against yourself, even if you have to testify against yourself, if the truth was somewhere else, and uh, someone has to you know, testify against you, or uh, the truth is not with you, you still have to uphold justice. Even if you have to go against yourself, or your fathers, or your you know, parents, or your relatives. Uh, and this is not easy when uh, justice brings harm to you. 
yet the Quran is asking us to still uphold justice. So this is how important it is. Uh, obviously, in the tradi tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, we see many injunctions like that. Uh, I think the one I want to mention is a divine uh, hadith, hadith Qudsi, meaning that it is Allah himself who spoke it. And in that hadith, what he says, Ya ibadi, inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharraman fala tadhalam. What is interesting about this uh, divine tradition, you see here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say, uh, you know, uh, zulm or injustice is haram. Rather, he says, I have made injustice forbidden on myself, and I have made it forbidden on you. So he begins with himself before he talks about, uh, you know, his servants. It's very interesting because usually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do that. He tells us something is haram. He tells us something is halal. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to tell us that he made injustice haram on himself. Now, obviously, nowadays, when we talk about haram, usually, and unfortunately, some scholars have limited themselves to just talking about what we're not allowed to eat, what we're not allowed to drink, what we're not allowed to wear, etc. But rarely we talk about other things which are clearly haram in our faith and our religion, and one of them is injustice. And for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come out and say something like that, to say that I have forbidden it on myself, as if now he is like the role model. Like, I have forbidden it on myself, and so should you. And you follow through. Um, there is another hadith which I think is going to be much more relevant to the activism part. Like, okay, we know injustice is haram. We know we're not supposed to commit any injustice. But what about other people committing injustice? What do we do about that? Do we uh, sit still? Do we watch them do it? Do we uh, observe the injustice, comment on it, and that's it? What do we do? What is our job? What is our responsibility as people following the Muslim faith? There is also a, a very uh, pivotal hadith that a lot of scholars use in this regard. And the hadith doesn't just talk about injustice. But it is very important when it comes to um, stopping evil, uh, when it comes to uh, standing up to evil, any kind of evil. So here you see the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying in that narration, he said, if you see an evil, then you go and change it with your hands. And if you cannot, if you cannot, then you have to change it with, with your what? Your tongue. You have to speak against it. And then he said, And if you're not able to do so, then you should change it with your heart. And that is the least of iman. There's no iman after that. There's no faith after that. What you notice in this hadith, first of all, is that the Prophet ﷺ linked faith to changing uh, evil and standing up to evil. There's a link between the two. And in fact, there are levels of faith according to your level of activ activism against evil. So the highest level of faith would be the highest level of activism against evil and so on, until you reach a point where all you're doing is you're recognizing that this is evil, and that's all you can do. But notice in this hadith, it is not allowing you any lower level. For example, you cannot say, I see evil, but I don't care. At least you have to dislike it. If you can't do anything about it, at least you have to dislike it. Why is that important? Because what's going to happen, a lot of times you're not able to speak, you're not able to do anything. But if you're not able to recognize it as evil anymore, if you look at injustice and you don't care, and injustice and justice are the same to you, then there's a big, big problem. And that's actually something that is happening these days. Now we're getting accustomed and used to injustice, and people don't care. Uh, we see atrocities every day. 
in front, in front of our eyes. It's not happening here, alhamdulillah. It's happening uh, somewhere uh, on this earth. And we know it's happening to people, to human beings. And the world is sitting and watching and doing nothing. This is below any amount of faith. Like when you're there, you, do, you no longer recognize good from evil. You no longer recognize justice from injustice. Now you've come to a level that you probably don't have any faith. You don't have any iman. So it's a, 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 a warning from the Prophet, peace be upon him, that the least you should have is the recognition of evil and injustice, and that you dislike it. Uh, you dislike it really much in your heart. Now, another thing that uh, I would like to mention about this narration, because some people might take it to the other extreme, and what they understand from the first level, which is that you're supposed to change it by your, your hand, is that you have to use violence. And that's, like I said, the other extreme. You have one extreme which is totally, you know, heedless or they're not there, they don't care. And then you have the other uh, extreme which is uh, extremist, if you will. Meaning that they're using illegal means in the Sharia to uh, accomplish justice or their perceived notion of justice. And I can say that maybe it is a consensus among the scholars of Islam throughout history that you're not allowed to, if there is, for example, an unjust ruler, that you go and use force against them. Because what's going to happen is anarchy. And anarchy is far worse than uh, injustice committed by a ruler. What you do instead is you speak up against it. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ praised the person who speaks up against an unjust ruler, and he said this is the highest level of struggle of jihad. He didn't say to fight him, he said to speak up against him. Now, this hadith, like I said, talks about evil. It does not talk about injustice, but because we have all the other narrations that tells us that injustice is one of the worst types of sins, it's a major sin. This is why we say, no doubt, it is part of evil, and this hadith applies to injustice just like it applies to anything else, if not much more. Not only that, we know the Prophet told us in another narration, he says that that injustice in this life, any act of injustice, will turn into darkness on the Day of Judgment. And he used the plural, uh, plural uh, tense. He said, which is like layers and layers of, of darkness on the Day of Judgment. Now, what about this country? I mean, we talk about injustice. People think of overseas. They probably think of Syria or Egypt or something like that. And these are just recent examples. Obviously, we have other examples of injustice. And people think of injustice, maybe people, innocent people dying, uh, people's homes destroyed, people being tortured. That's the kind of injustice that comes to mind because it is so obvious. But it doesn't mean that this country doesn't have any type of injustice. And this is the reason we have organizations like CARE and other organizations. Sometimes injustice could be subtle. It will be hard to detect. And this is part of our mission, to educate uh, the American uh, society, the American people, that there are some types of injustice that you probably don't recognize because you don't, uh, you don't uh, live in our shoes. You don't, uh, you know, you don't face the uh, problems we face. I mean, obviously, one example would be civil rights violations, and we deal with them on a regular basis. But I want to talk about even a more subtle form of injustice that I think, right now, Muslims are going through. And I'm sure other minorities have gone through in the past. But today, I think Muslims are suffering from that type of injustice much more than anyone else. And some people might uh, refer to it as Islamophobia which is this extreme, unjustified fear of Islam. Now, I can bring many examples of that. I think very simple examples would be how Islam is being mis misrepresented. If you go to any bookstore and try and go to the religious uh, section, and you see 
uh, all these books about Ju Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, any kind of religion, even very uh, um, a, minor a minority religion, you find in Hinduism everything. And you could say fairly enough that they are well represented. SubhanAllah, immediately when you look at the uh, Islam section, you notice that it's mostly anti-Islam, really. It's not Islam, or it's not written by Muslims even. And it's not just written by non-Muslims, it's written by anti-Islam authors. And you can say the same thing about uh, you know, blogs, websites, you can talk about the media in general, who comes on TV representing Islam. It's mostly non-Muslims, and not only non-Muslims, but anti-Islam experts, so-called. And obviously it happens more on uh, you know, stations like Fox, even the host sometimes pretends to know Islam and starts talking about Sharia and his definition of Sharia and so forth. And they make mistakes after mistakes and nobody cares. Nobody gets upset. And nobody recognizes that as injustice. Now some people might say, well this is a freedom of expression. Why are you so upset? Everybody has a right to say what they want to say. Everybody has a right to write what they want to write. Who's stopping you from writing about whatever topic you want to write about? And I say the issue is not freedom of expression. I'm not against anyone writing anything they want to write about or talking about anything they want to talk about. The problem is a misrepresentation. And in order to understand that, there's a very simple example we can bring. Imagine if a Muslim scholar or a Muslim author was brought to comment on a Christian issue or a Jewish issue, and let's say that issue might be unique to the Jews or the Christians, what kind of reaction would you expect? A lot of people would be upset. Like, this is not your area, it's not your business, and rightly so, it's not their business. I mean, just a small example recently, you all heard about the professor Riza Aslan, right? So he is an Iranian uh, American professor. He wrote a book about Jesus. And a lot of people were upset. And the reason for their you know, concern, if you will, was that he's writing about Jesus. And Jesus belongs to Christians. So they think. I mean, here it's not even true because we know uh, Jesus is also part of the Islamic faith. And uh, we believe in Jesus, we love Jesus, we believe in him as a prophet. Yet so many people were upset, again because of the same reason. It is because they thought that we were mis misrepresenting the image of Jesus they have in their minds. Maybe not the true Jesus, but we're misrepresenting that perceived Jesus, if you will. And because of that, it made him so upset. So what about all the books that were written about Prophet Muhammad I don't know if you have any idea. Lots of books have been written recently about Prophet Muhammad I And none of them is nice, by the way. A lot of them, in fact, contain a lot of errors, a lot of, uh, you know, attacks, insults. And I'm talking about big-time insults. I don't want to mention them here. I don't think it is proper to mention them. But that's okay. So this is the kind of injustice I'm talking about. It is a little subtle, like I said. It is not as clear as killing an infant or, you know, uh, demolishing a home in Palestine or somewhere. It's not as obvious, but it is no doubt an injustice that we have to uh, stand up against and fight. Because I tell you, years from now, and what's happening since 9-11, the amount of dislike, if I'm going to use a mild term, the amount of dislike toward Muslims has been rising because of this continuous campaign against Islam and Muslims. And it's very fair to call it Islamophobia. A lot of people get upset when you say Islamophobia and you say you're crying victimology. Yeah, maybe some Muslims pretend to be victims and not true victims, fine. But I don't want to even talk about isolated cases. I'm talking here about a trend 
that nobody can deny. A lot of people may not recognize because I think we have to do a better job going out there and speaking about it and putting someone else, uh, someone else in our shoes. Then they begin to, oh yeah, sure, we don't like that. We don't like someone, we don't like a, a Muslim author to come and write about Jesus. Well, then how come you allow many, many people, many authors to write about Muhammad? I mean, after all, justice is about being fair, treating everybody equally. So I think, inshallah, we have uh, a long way, and uh, uh, I think uh, Islam, like I said, itself is a tradition of justice. If anything we stand for, it is a justice. And it is a tradition. Unfortunately, nowadays, uh, Muslims don't provide, many, in many cases, not all the time, they don't provide a good role model for justice, especially when you talk about Muslim countries and you see all these dictators and so forth. But we in this country have a big opportunity to speak up and to uh, you know, uphold justice, not just for Muslims, for, for everyone. Inshallah. Zakum khair. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. You don't sound like you had lunch. Um, it's okay, we're from California. I won't be offended. We have high tolerance for people who are tired and exhausted. Um, thank you all for, for being here throughout the day, not just you know, not just right now, but I understand it's been a long day and I appreciate that you participated and engaged in the conversation. It's an honor and a privilege to be here to talk about the importance of standing up for ourselves, the importance of activism. Imam Anas covered the, the religious basis for, for activism that, that should, I think, move all of us to action, right? Is that frequently what we hear in our community, and those of us that have maybe professional activist careers, we hear from, from others who say, well, you know, like, as long as I go to the masjid and I pray, then, then that, that's sufficient, then I'm carrying out my religion. Or, you know, people will tell us, well, we want to separate spirituality from activism, right? Or we don't have an obligation to do that. Or, you know, if it doesn't impact Muslims, why why should I care? And I think that Imam Anas did a really great job of, of talking to us about dispelling all of that, right? That our activism is tied to our spirituality, that it's not sufficient to simply carry out the five pillars of, of practice and to not care about others. And that, and I think he mentioned this, but, you know, this is something that always stands out to me when speakers say this, is that Islam was sent as a mercy to mankind. It wasn't just sent as a mercy to Muslims, it was sent as a mercy to mankind. Right? And so that speaks specifically for me, at least, to the idea that we're not just obligated to help ourselves, to help our family and our community, that we have an obligation to our neighbors, we have an obligation to their neighbors, right? That when Prophet, peace be upon him, was asked about, you know, when we talk about neighbors and worrying about their hunger, how many neighbors, right? Who, how many neighbors? And it was said 40 houses in each direction, right? And so the question I sometimes ask audiences is, how many of you know your next door neighbor's names? I don't, I just moved, I don't know my next door neighbor's name. What about two houses down? Three houses down? Four houses down, right? And so I, I think it's commendable that you know some of them, which is still more than I know, right? But it, it's sort of a stark reminder to me that 40 houses in each direction is a lot of people that we should be caring about, right? That that, that is itself the first level. But the thing that I wanted to focus on is why, right? Like from, from an American perspective, why, why should we speak out against injustice? What does our history as Americans thinking about this earlier and frequently I, I start some of these stories with Japanese American internment or, or the African American slave trade but I think it's, it's important to go even further behind that right is that the pilgrims came over here to escape religious persecution that that idea of the freedom to worship is something that is central to our country's history but what did Columbus and his sort of fellow travelers do to the Native American Right, is that yes, people came over here looking for better economic opportunities and religious freedom and wanting to find the new world, and what did they do? They, I mean, I, anything short of genocide, I think, is an understatement of what the Native Americans experienced at the hands of, of the founders of this country, right? That sets the groundwork, then, for slavery, right? That slavery doesn't just happen in a vacuum. Slavery doesn't just pop up in this country. Is that we do this to Native Americans. We kill them, we murder them, we... we we drove them nearly to extinction, right? We signed treaties with them that we broke, we gave them land that we took away. 
does it then surprise anyone that we brought people over from other parts of the world, treated them like cattle, chained them, moved them across ship, moved them across the world in ships where they couldn't move for months at a time. They would get over here and some of the people wouldn't have made it. Their bodies would be part of sort of the, the pile of bodies that, that were unloaded from the ship, that they were then traded on the open market. Like, you know, close your eyes and actually, yeah, close your eyes and visualize that for a second. Like, imagine going to the local mall and you're going to the store and there are people in chains with price tags on them. Like, that's such a frightening thing to think about, right? And then that's a part of this country's legacy as well. And so when we talk about being an American Muslim, I think it's important to recognize that, yes, there are values and ideals in this country that we want to live up to, but we also have this really problematic history. It doesn't end with Africa. Right? It sort of continues. We have the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, where we don't allow Chinese Americans to immigrate to the United States. We have World War II internment of Japanese Americans. And I always correct myself. My, I'm still trained to say internment, but I'm trying to remind myself that they weren't internment camps. They weren't you know, places where you put people that you want to treat with respect. They were concentration camps. Many have said that the only difference between the concentration camps in the United States that house Japanese Americans and the concentration camps in Germany that house Jewish Americans, Jewish um, individuals were the gas chambers. But the idea that you would take people from their home, that they, homes that they lived in for decades, that they could only carry what they, they could only take what they could carry. If it could fit in a suitcase, they could take it with them, right? They didn't know if they would ever come back to their home. They didn't know where they were going. They were put on trains and sort of just sent out into the wilderness, right? They were rounded up by the military and by the FBI. And uh, how many of you here by chance have ever been to a Japanese uh, concentration camp? There are still a few that you can so I believe there is one in Arizona, and, and I do strongly recommend that you visit it. It's an incredibly moving experience, and I think it brings home a lot of the issues that we talk about when we talk about civil rights issues. And so there's, um, we've been to a couple in California, but there's also a museum that replicates uh, the Japanese American, uh, like the housing units on the concentration camps. And you take this room and you're thinking, well, it's kind of a big room for a conference. Huge room if we're talking about a living room. Imagine dividing this room in four to six sections and putting an entire family in there indefinitely. Right? No restroom, no privacy, no walls. You didn't even have solid walls between you and your neighbors. But there was space between the roofs, and so they were all sort of connected. And that's what we did to them. Why? Because of their skin color, because of the shape of their eyes, because of where they came from. We didn't just send them to concentration camps, we subjected them to loyalty tests that asked them about their loyalty to Japan. Some of these people had never been to Japan that asked them if they would serve in the military. And to me, I think, you know, that's a really easy question. If the military is rounding me up and sending me to a concentration camp, would I serve in that military? Heck no, right? Like, is it really even a debate? But that was a test of their loyalty. And when they failed those loyalty tests, they were sent to even worse concentration camps, hundreds of thousands of Japanese Americans. There were Japanese Americans who had surgery to change the shape of their eyes to try to escape the concentration camps. You know, we talk in the Muslim community about, do I shave my beard, do I not shave my beard? Do I wear my hijab? Do I not wear my hijab? And I don't mean the discussion of whether or not I want to wear a hijab. I mean the discussion of should I wear my hijab in the context of Islamophobia in a post-9-11 environment. Imagine surgery to change the shape of your eyes, right? And when people like Fred Korematsu challenged their detention, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the federal government said, we want to do this. And the, and the judiciary branch agreed. They said, this is OK, right? That this was sanctioned by the courts, and I'll talk about how we implement our activism shortly, but that happens. Then you have the Cold War, where anyone who was thought to be communist, right, you looked like a communist, you breathed like a communist, maybe you once said you liked Russia, like you weren't actually a communist, but if you were mistaken for a communist, you were blacklisted. You were attacked, there was an inquisition that happened, right, that there were the, the McCarthy era hearings, where you, everyone around you, like you didn't want to be associated. Again, we think about how sometimes people don't want to be friends with Muslims, it was far worse. People lost their jobs, they lost their careers. If you were in Hollywood, you could never work again, right? They, your career ended if you were accused of this. What was it? It was a thought crime, right? The idea that I might think that the redistribution of wealth by the government could be a good idea, right? Not even that I would agree, that I could think, that I could contemplate that possibility. And then you had COINTELPRO, right? One of the more recent sort of invasions of our civil liberties with African-American civil rights activists being targeted by law enforcement. So much of what Trevor talked about in the earlier session in terms of entrapment and sending agent provocateurs into the community started then, right? Like it started in that time is that you never knew who you were hanging out with, you never knew who you could trust, 
one of the intentional consequences of COINTELPRO was to destabilize activism. Because if I'm so busy worrying about who the informant in my community is, then I don't have time to organize a rally or write letters or go to my elected officials. I'm too busy being, trying to figure out who the, the informant is. And so as a side note, so you have the war on drugs, where every black and brown person right, who was from Mexico, South Asia, South, South America or Africa, was believed to potentially be selling drugs. Right? The skin color was what determined if you should be suspected of selling drugs. And so why do I talk about all of these things? I'm not reminding this group about how people have fought and died for the right to vote. People have fought and died for the right to drink from the same water fountains, to be served at the same restaurants, to have the employment opportunities. People have fought and died challenging law enforcement, right? But that is also the founding of this country, is challenging the monarchy, saying that you know we want representation in our government, that we want a voice in the policies that, that are enacted. And I'm not reminding you in detail of that, because I think we know that. That's the part that we're told in, in our public school history books, that, that we all want to celebrate on July 4th and, um, and Memorial Day. And I think that that's really important to, to remember and celebrate, but that it should be taken in context with this other history, right? And so we know that people fight and die for our civil liberties, but we also know that our civil liberties disappear overnight. Do you think that it took them one or two or three years to, to remove our civil liberties following 9-11, or that they disappeared on September 12th, right? Many Muslims will say that we suffered, that we were attacked twice, on 9-11-2001 and then again on 9-12-2001. Our civil liberties disappear very quickly. They are harder to get than they are to lose, right? So it can take 100 years to win the right to vote for women and people of color. It can take another 50 years to get desegregation in school. And overnight, you can lose all of that. And that's what we're seeing today. And so the war on drugs is, is the more recent example. And, and the reason I talk to the Muslim community about the war on drugs is because I grew up in a household where I was taught about activism. I was told what Islam said about justice. But we also, to be very frank, believe that people who do drugs are bad, that they should be arrested, that they should be punished, that everybody in jail is guilty, right? And the death penalty is a good thing, and that you know harsh punishment is a good thing, and you know it should be harsher punishment, right? We don't want our kids in gangs, and we don't want our kids in drugs, and so we've got to clean up the streets and send everybody who might be doing drugs to jail. We grew up watching cops, right? I don't know if anyone here watches cops. It's a very problematic show. It glorifies law enforcement culture, and it really denigrates entire communities. The thing that we forget when we watch cops is that the people who are being arrested and harassed on cops have not been convicted of a crime. Right? That's before any evidence has been presented. That's before they've had a, challenge, a chance to challenge the evidence. They haven't had a jury of their peers. But what are we doing? Right? We're, we're sort of treating everyone as potentially criminal. And, so, and I don't think that my experience was unique. I think that this was sort of a common sentiment in the Muslim community about the war on drugs. Is we came over here for good jobs, to pay our bills, to send our kids to college. Right? We don't want anybody messing with drugs. No nuanced conversations about what happens with addiction and how that's actually a medical issue. No nuanced conversations about what the pharmaceutical industry is doing to influence drug policy, right? Why is it that I'm willing to take drugs from someone in a white coat who's been to school for a few years, right? I don't ask any questions about what their motivations are. But, you know, someone has a degree in herbal medicine and says, hey, it came from the ground, maybe it's not terrible for you. And I'm not here to advocate for, for any changes to drug laws, but I'm saying that we weren't having those conversations in our community. And so when entire communities were being persecuted, we watched. And we didn't say anything. And so the story that I always share that, that ties this back to the Muslim experience is that of a young man that we represent. His name is Yasser Afifi. He was 20 years old. He's Arab American. His father was a leader in the community. He passed away a few years prior to this incident. But you know, not, not particularly overly religious, just your average Arab American young man sending money back home to support his family, working, staying in school, doing what young people do. Took his car in for an oil change one day and he looked under the car. And what did he find? He found a GPS tracking device. Black box, this big, and then a battery pack about this big. They took it off the car, him and the mechanic and a friend took it off the car. They didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was, right? Like no one would know. First question is, is it a bomb? which is you know, a reasonable question to ask when you find a mysterious black box. They didn't figure it out. They went home, they took pictures of it, they put it online. Other tech geeks on Reddit figured out that it was a tracking device, right? And they said, what do we do? Do we sell it on eBay? Do we throw it in a lake? Do we put it on a police car? What do we, again, all reasonable questions. The next day, the FBI showed up at his house and they said, it's really expensive. 
Did you find it? We want it back. I'm not kidding. Um, it's, it's the kind of story that you think, really? Like, it's just, it's so, it, it boggles the imagination, but that's what happened. We verified it with the mechanic. We verified it with the FBI because we asked for his file, right? And so in 2011, we, we sued the government on his behalf to say that you violated his Fourth Amendment rights. We put our lawsuit on hold later on in the year because the Supreme Court was reviewing another case, Jones v. United States, and this was the case of an African-American man who was accused of selling drugs. And the FBI, or law enforcement, got a, a search warrant for 30 days to place a tracking device on his car. For some reason, again, I don't know why, they placed the tracking device on his car on day 31. So the warrant had expired. And they found a bunch of evidence, and then they tried to you know, take it to trial. And, and he was represented by the ACLU, and the ACLU said, no, you didn't have a search warrant, right? It went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Why does this matter? This was a victim of the war on drugs who had the same type of tracking being done to him as a victim of the war on terror. It takes no energy to lose your civil liberties, right? What happened when, the, when this was happening to people, right? Because time is difficult to convey here, but for a case to get to the Supreme Court, you're looking at at least five to 10 years of, of litigation, if not more. So that had happened to him five, at least five to 10 years prior to it happened to our client. But what, what was happening five to 10 years prior when we were in the middle of the war on drugs? The Muslim community, my family, myself, said this isn't our problem. We're not selling drugs. Whatever, you know, you do to the criminals what you do to the criminals, right? We have to protect our communities. That sounds so much like what people say about our community today. You do to the terrorists what you need to do to the terrorists, right? We need to stop them, and that's what it is. And so here you have, it takes, so law enforcement had instituted this practice. It took 10 years for the courts to review it. And in that time, guess what? The practice had translated to another community. Because you lose the civil liberty and it doesn't come back so easily. The court said, by attaching something to his car, you violated the Fourth Amendment. They never reached the question of the actual sort of tracking process, right? Like, does following him 24 hours a day, through whatever means, violate his right to, to be free from a search? They only got to the question of the attachment, right? So you all sort of like had this look on your face when I told you how big the tracking device was. It was this big. What have we learned in the last six months? Verizon, AT&T, our phone companies, our computer providers, they're providing that information already. You don't need tracking devices that big. It took 10 years, if not more, to fix this one issue, and the courts didn't catch up in time. So by the time the court gives you the decision in 2012 that says, yeah, attachment is a violation of the rights, law enforcement says, eh, you know, we don't really need to attach stuff anyways anymore. We just get it from the GPS providers, from the cell phone tower providers. And so I'll stop here. Actually, so. Two things. I close with this example because I think that it is a great illustration of how when we don't speak out for other communities, it impacts us next, right? Imam Anas shared with us that, that we have an obligation to speak out, and so I would argue that there is a selfless obligation to speak out, that our religion says we challenge justice, it, we challenge injustice whenever we see it, whether it's the Asian American community, the African American community, the Jewish community, the Catholic, whoever it is, we challenge injustice. That's the selfless reason, right? Because our faith teaches us to. The selfish reason is because when you don't challenge it when it happens to someone else, guess who's next? We are, right? So there's this, and, and I would hope we would all do it for the selfless reason, but if that's not enough, the selfish reason should also take you there. The other thing that I'll say is that there are oftentimes questions about how do we challenge injustice. I talked about the courts. I think that as a lawyer, I definitely think that the courts are a great option but they can take 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and you don't always get a good decision. In the last 12 years, we've seen so many bad decisions on torture, on Guantanamo Bay, on immunity for members of the executive branch who commit crimes in their official capacities, right? So the courts are one solution, but that's not the only solution. The other solution is people, right? Is that it's really important that you're talking to people, that you're talking to your neighbors, right? Imagine if we knew 40 houses in each direction and then we tried to open a masjid in that neighborhood. Do you think we'd get opposition? Probably very less likely so, right? Because they'd all say, oh, Sister Amina, she brings me cupcakes on Eid. Or like, you know, Sister Amina, 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 that's not even a really good example. Sister Farah, right? It's like Sister Farah knows when I'm sick, she visits me at the hospital, right? Brother Muhammad, he, he saw I had problems with my car, he helped me. And so I would urge you, and we can talk about this in the last session, inshallah, that don't just look to the courts. Don't just look to what you think of maybe traditional activism. It's not all letter writing, and it's not all rallies. 
It's getting to know your neighbors. It's talking to people. Because by the time the courts catch up with the decisions, if they ever catch up with the right decisions, right? I told you that during World War II, they, they sanctioned the, the, the internment or the sending to concentration camps of Japanese Americans. In the last 10 years, they've left Guantanamo Bay open, right? That there's over 100 people there who have been on a, on a hunger strike, right? That there are people there who've been cleared for release and remain there, and the courts haven't sided with us. And so I hope that this will lead to some interesting question and answer, but also to the next session to, to talk about how we as individuals go back to our communities and, and make change, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Those are amazing aspects on what we should do as activists, Islamically, as well as Americans. First of all, I forgot the hadith that even if you feel it in your heart that it's wrong, then that's something enough, because sometimes I feel like I don't do enough. And second of all, alhamdulillah, it's nice to know that a way to stop injustice and a way to get people to know you is simply knowing other people. And we kind of forget that because in my mind we're so secluded, but we need to go out there and, and really make ourselves known. We can't be in a bubble forever. With that said, um, would anyone like to ask any questions? Anybody? Better use them now before they leave. Okay. Do we just end? Well, what do you guys think about um, just going and, you know, what do you think it is enough for us right now just to say in our heart, because there's a lot of injustice going on right now in other countries as well as in America. Do you think we have come to that place where we can just feel it in our heart and know that it's wrong, or should we do more as, as we go past that stage? What do you guys think about that?